Good afternoon. I'm Claire Brindis, and I'm the director of the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies. And on behalf of the John Eisenberg Legacy Lectureship, I want to welcome each and every one of you. I know many of you are the Jean Washington fan club, <laughs> uh, and we will soon be uh, having uh, an opportunity to hear from Jean directly. But um, for a moment, I just want to say that the legacy of John Eisenberg touches all of our lives. This is the 11th lecture, and as many of you know, the award was the lectureship was set up to honor John's vision and his courage and his leadership. The types of topics that he was so advanced in thinking about, considering whether it was patient-centered care, quality, safety, social disparities, the intersection between medicine and population health, these are all topics that continue to impact all our, our work in health services research, health outcomes, and policy. And it's really wonderful that the legacy that John's memory invokes in all of us is also reflected and we're so fortunate that members of his family are here with us, including Dee Dee, his wife, um, his son Mike, and daughter-in-law Kaylee, as well as his sister-in-law Pat. So we're really happy that you're here to be part of this event. Several Bay Area uh, academic institutions come together to plan this event. And so I want to acknowledge Hal Luft from Pamphrey, Steve Shortell from UC Berkeley School of Public Health, as well as Arnie Milstein from Stanford, who unfortunately is traveling today but sends you all his warmest regards. We also have a national advisory board that helps us choose the candidate for the lectureship each year. And I can say um, without any concern that when Jean's name was brought up that there was a very strong um, applause for him to be um, the candidate for today, the, the nominee or the lectureship. But I also want to say that it's a homecoming to Jean uh, because many of us have long-standing relationships with him, so it's really a double honor. Finally, I want to really thank uh, Sandra Hernandez and the California Healthcare Foundation for really being so gracious about helping us to maintain this lectureship. And I could spend the rest of the time just talking about Sandra's leadership and the work that she has done at the cutting edge and so much reflective of her work in the kind of work that John had established, both in terms of being the leader at the city and county uh, health department in San Francisco, previously the president of the San Francisco Foundation, and now the president of the California Healthcare Foundation. So I'm gonna welcome Sandra to make a few remarks. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much, and welcome everybody. I uh, want to also acknowledge the Eisenberg family, and thank you all for being here. Um, it is a, maybe a triple bottom line because, of course, in addition to Gene as an academic and a clinician and a researcher and administrator, uh, Gene also served on the board of the California Healthcare Foundation for nine years, uh, where, among many other things, it will not surprise you that he was uh, pushing the organization to be more strategic, to think more carefully about evaluation, and perhaps most importantly of all, to think about impact and how the work that was commissioned by the foundation actually makes an impact in communities. So I could not be any prouder to be here today uh, to both hear what Gene has to offer but also to tell you that on behalf of the California Healthcare Foundation, we're very happy to be a sponsor of uh, this conversation today. So with no further ado, Jean. I'm very pleased to give a little bit of background about John, and, and, and to some extent, um, I, I have a special closeness to John Eisenberg because he and I grew up in, uh, were born in the same year. He started out in medicine, did a little bit of economics. I started out in economics, didn't do medicine, but I worked in healthcare sy systems. Um, I worked with John uh, on the Council of the Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research, which then became Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, after its near-death experience. 
and um, unfortunately, uh, that is coming back again. This is like these vampire stories. Uh, people in Congress are trying to kill it again. Uh, but John pulled AHCPR into AHRQ, and he did it in a very thoughtful and very strategic way. He thought about how it would be more survivable by not just doing and funding research, but by doing and funding research that made a difference to cl clinicians, that made a difference to people, that could be seen by policymakers in terms of how things were being reported, et cetera. And that was an extraordinary vision that he brought to a federal agency um, and changed it and it became really important. One of the things that I'd like to mention also is that John was a great mentor. He has dozens and dozens and dozens of people who trained under him, who know how he worked his way through the world and did research that made an impact and did policy that made an impact. One of the most telling memories I have of John was at a, a 1997 uh, Association for Health Services Research, which is now Academy Health, um, annual meeting. It was a round table. Um, we actually sponsored it <coughs> from IHPS, where you could write a check and put your name on the door, uh, but you had no control over everything. And John gave this wonderful talk about work-life balance. And Didi and family, I'm sorry you weren't there, but he was talking about how important that was, especially because it was on Father's Day. And yet he was there <laughs> feeling very guilty. Um, and so I think uh, all those parts, policy, research, balance, mentorship, those are the kinds of things that we're looking for uh, when we think about the uh, Eisenberg leg Legacy Lecturer, and uh, that's why we have Gene. That's Steve. Well, it's a <coughs> special pleasure for me to be able to uh, introduce Gene to you. He's known, I think, to almost everyone in this room. And uh, first of all, let me say that the uh, correlation between the attributes that Hal just described about John Eisenberg and Gene Washington, I think, are like about 1.0. Uh, but that sounds like it's not very credible. So maybe it's only 0.9, Gene, yeah, margin for error there. Um, but uh, uh, Gene really epitomizes uh, all of John's vision and all that John accomplished that Gene is now and has accomplished and will continue to accomplish in his career. So I could go on quite a bit and give him a long introduction, but that will cut into his time. We really do want to hear from him. Or I could do it really short, but I decided to do intermediate. So I'm just going to hit a few highlights here. As you know, he is now Chancellor of the Health Sciences and also President CEO of the Duke Health System. And previous to that, the last five years or so, he was the uh, Vice Chancellor at UCLA and Dean of the Medical School. And as you know, previous to that, he was among us here uh, at UCSF and then the Bay Area. And in fact, I think in the 11 years that we've honored people around the country, this is the first time, I could be wrong, that we've honored somebody from the Bay Area. Uh, so this is also very special from that perspective. Uh, Gene uh, has been really a national leader in assessing medical technologies, translating research into policy and practice. He has spearheaded a lot of efforts around cervical cancer screening, reproduction-related infections. He's been a terrific thought leader in calling for academic health uh, systems to reconfigure broadly. And we're going to hear some of that today, I'm sure, and to engage in new care delivery models. Uh, he has been received many awards for his work. Uh, cite a few. He is recipient of the David Rogers Award from the Association of American Medical Colleges and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for his major contributors to improving health and health care of the American people. He's also received the Outstanding uh, Services Medal from the U.S. Public Health Services, uh, was elected to the Institute of Medicine, uh, now the National Academy of Medicine, and also the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He uh, uh, also, among other things, prior to joining UCLA, uh, when he was here as the Executive Vice Chancellor at UCSF, he co-founded a research center that studied medical effectiveness for diverse populations and co-founded the UCSF Stanford 
evidence-based practice center, and I see some of you affiliated with that center uh, here today. He also led the implementation of the UCSF diversity initiative and promoted campus-wide programs to enhance the quality of life for faculty, staff, and students. Before that, he chaired the ob gyne Department, Reproductive Sciences as well, and before he came to UCSF, he was at the CDC in Atlanta, so you get a little bit of the breadth of his career uh, in, in interest. He's also the founding chair of the Board of Governors of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or P. Corey, uh, as we know it. Uh, and uh, in that regard, his significant contributions as the founding chair, they've established the Eugene Washington Engagement Award, which supports active integration of patient stakeholder and research communities during the research process. They had their first uh, national meeting, annual meeting in D.C. a few weeks ago. I wasn't able to make Gene's talk. I was there later, but I heard all kinds of wonderful comments. Uh, about your remarks at that first annual uh, meeting. Uh, I would also say, Steve. pardon? <laughs> I'm almost done, I, 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 I am almost done. But one of the things I think, uh, you know, in terms of where does he come from in terms of his energy uh, really uh, comes a lot from his family. Uh, and his uh, father was, uh, was a minister and he grew up in Houston and he's I indicated that his family, his mother and father instilled in him uh, the core values of excellence, uh, integrity and service, and those remain his lifelong drivers. I've had an opportunity to personally experience his, uh, his generosity, his generous spirit. Uh, a number of years ago when I assumed the deanship at Berkeley, I had a number of people I wanted to see to seek advice. Gene beat me to it. He called me up and said, come on over, let's talk. How can we strengthen and deepen the already uh, good relationships between the two campuses? And in particular, help gave me uh, some very sage advice in terms of fundraising as well. And I know for a fact, he's reached out to a lot of people throughout his career, probably people in this room in that regard. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce Gene Washington. Please join me as he comes to the podium. Thank you, Steve. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You know, I'm back at UCSF where uh, by uh, national reputation, there's more energy in the Bay Area than any other place in the United States, so I expected a more robust response. <laughs> so I'm gonna try it again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. That sounds much better. Do I need to mic? Can I get mic'd up here? Um, Shortly after it was announced that I was going to be the um, this year's uh, John Eisenberg uh, lecturer, legacy lecturer, uh, one of our UCSF colleagues um, uh, say to me, Gene, it would be great to have you back at UCSF. It would be like the prodigal son coming home. <laughs> now, uh, you just mentioned, Steve, that my father was a minister. So I know the parable of the prodigal son. <laughs> And so I didn't quite know how to take that. So I, I went to the dictionary and um, <laughs> sure enough, behaves recklessly, makes a repentant return. Um, now, I didn't like this definition at all, so I did what, you know, uh, uh, you're taught in medical school. I got a second opinion. And it wasn't much better, a um, little softer, but in this case, a man who leaves his organization it, in order to do something that they did not approve of. <laughs> and now returns feeling sorry for what I did. I'm not sure what I did, but um, this story gets a little better. Uh, this is me down here now in this picture. And you can see I'm pretty, I'm, I'm, I'm looking pretty destitute there. But for those artists in the crowd, this is a very famous painting uh, by Rembrandt. It's considered to be one of his last paintings. Um, and many of you will know the story of the parable of the re of returning son. So that's the main characters, you know, the father and the brother. But there are a couple of other interesting characters in this picture, according to the scholars. There is, with the point of, there is this figure right here, according to the scholars, say, because of the way he's dressed, you can tell he's a wise person, uh, a person of, you know, wealth and stature. So I thought about the people who've given me advice over the years, and uh, I saw David Werdegar, he would appear on that list. There are others, you know. But I finally decided that that was Haile DeBoss. So we're going to say that's wide man DeBoss. 
this figure here is a female who just exudes kind of love and caring and somebody was glad to see you know the 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 the, the son come back home and I certainly talk about thought about the women over the years at UCSF who've taken care of me. I saw Eunice, she came to mind. I thought about Elena Gates in the department. But I finally decided that that's Nancy Adler. But <laughs> this is before her hair turned black, okay? And then, of course, given that this is UCSF context, this has got to be Sam, you know? Uh, that's before he cut his beard, before coming here from Australia. But probably the most significant figure, if you remember the parable, was the brother. And here's the brother right here. And I thought about a few people, including you, Kevin. But I finally decided that this was a taller version, slightly taller version of Jeff Bluestone. Yeah. Um, and so if you bring this picture to life, just envision the conversation, OK? I'm not saying much, because I have no energy and I'm hungry, yeah, because I'm destitute. OK, and wise man, the boss is saying, told you so. Um, <laughs> Loving, caring Nancy is saying, can I get you some water? And of course, if you remember the story, the, the father says, kill the fatty calf. To which Jeff exclaims, no way. <laughs> Feed him cake. Uh, more seriously, I, it is, in fact, a uh, delight to be back here uh, today. Um, I am a proud graduate of UCSF, of Berkeley. Uh, and Stanford, and as Sandra mentioned, I served on the board at the, uh, um, at the California Healthcare uh, uh, Foundation. So in many regards, this is my home here in, in the Bay Area. Um, importantly, I am also deeply honored to have been asked to participate in this celebration and this recognition of the legacy of, uh, of uh, Dr. John Eisenberg. I also knew, knew John. And anyone that knew him knew that he was a remarkably imaginative, a deeply driven individual for good, and also uh, an intensely caring individual. So uh, it is an honor for me to be here uh, uh, celebrating his legacy of, of leadership uh, and excellence and impact at the, at the highest level. So thank you very much to the committee for inviting me. And thank you, Claire, for not taking no. Uh, I tried twice, but on the third time, Claire was not having it, and I capitulated. And I'm glad that you won, Claire, because here I am. So t today I'm going to be talking about academic health system's third curve. Uh, and that third curve is population health improvement. So if nothing else, when you leave, you should know what the difference is and what we mean and what I mean by population health Im improvement. This is not an evidence or data-driven presentation. Uh, and in fact, this represents some thoughts that have been percolated in my mind over the last couple of years early on, but now I have some collaborators. And so it's a work in progress, and I'm going to encourage you to not think of this as a lecture, but more as a discussion. So you can raise your hand at points, and I wait to the end and ask questions. You can challenge me. Uh, and certainly, uh, you can comment. Uh, the framework in terms of what I want to cover relates to this idea that, and I say here what we believe. This, this is set to context. Right now, there's a great deal of tension, uh, pressure being placed on academic health systems. I'm talking about the Stanfords and the UCSFs and the UCLAs and the Dukes of the world to move toward what's called population health management. And I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. And our argument is, is that while these health systems are moving toward population health management, with some additional attention, on some other uh, dimensions of health. Uh, these health systems can also help drive population health improvement. I just covered this background without going through it uh, um, um, again. And so today, these are the four areas that I, I want to address. And again, I'm going to invite you, encourage you to not wait until the end. What is population health improvement? Why academic health systems? What is needed to advance population health improvement? And what should academic health systems specifically do? First, uh, these are my collaborators. Um, uh, Ebony, I've met since I've been at Duke. Uh, early this year, we did, in fact, establish a new uh, center at Duke, the Center for Community and Population Health Improvement. Many of you know Molly Coy. She served as Director of Health Services here in the state, also was the founder 
uh, the uh, 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 Health Tech uh, Foundation. And then uh, some of you will know uh, Kelly uh, uh, Brownell. I was actually, even though he's at Duke, introduced to him uh, through Nancy when she was in town um, um, for a visit. You know, I put these individuals up front because they really are true collaborators. And so what I'm presenting here represents thinking from the group, uh, not just uh, what I've been thinking um, alone. First question, what is population health improvement? So I'll ask, how many of you have a notion of what population health improvement is? Raise your hand. Okay, because I'm gonna ask you at the end if you feel that, I'm gonna ask you how many of you who had a notion uh, had the one that I had in mind, but I won't ask you that yet since I haven't told you what I have in mind. So what is population health improvement? I'm gonna start at the very high level of thinking about the U.S. population you know, 300 or so million people. And then there's the state of California approaching, you know, 30 million or so. And within the state of California, whether you know it or not, all the counties within the state of California have their health ranked. And I'm gonna show you some data from that in a minute. And this is a picture depicting the county of San Francisco, which is about 830, 850, uh, 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 a thousand uh, individuals, and below it is Santa Clara. Uh, originally, I was going to provide you some data on Santa Clara, but I'm going to focus on San Francisco. And the idea with population health, from my perspective, at a, at a high level, would be that in San Francisco, this is the population. These, pi these pictures depict uh, the 830 so thousand individuals. Within this population, there are individuals who currently come to UCSF for care. That's individual patient care. That's still 80 to 90 percent of what we do. It's fee for service. It's transactional. They come in from San Francisco to across the city and county and they get care. This is individual patient care. What we're moving toward is what is, even though we call it population health, it's really population health management. And what this means is, is that rather than a group of individuals coming in as individuals, UCSF now is responsible for managing a population, a group of patients within San Francisco. And they're doing that for a set budget. Similar, essentially, to what Kaiser has done. This is population health management, or what I think of as version 2.0. Population health improvement, and you're going to hear this again, I'm just giving you different depictions, is when there is an effort w across a multi-sector, multi-stakeholder group to actually elevate the overall health of the entire population. Okay, that's population health improvement distinct from population health management. And so the definition as we think of it is, version 1.0 is where we are right now. And that is, mostly about illness care, individuals coming in for care. Version 2.0, which is population health management, is where we've got a set budget to manage the health of a population of individuals under our care. And population health improvement is version 3.0, where we're shifting emphasis uh, from individual care on illness to more on the health of the overall population, and importantly, in population health improvement, there's a greater emphasis on these non-healthcare factors and influences. So how many of you, from the beginning, when I say population health improvement, was thinking of population health improvement in this manner? Okay, quite a few of you. Kevin, I noticed you didn't raise your hand. <laughs> Yeah, okay. And no, I, I'm not saying, now, Kevin, we had a conversation earlier, and I asked him, because I heard from, who was it, one of the junior faculty members in a meeting, said we have an office of population health. And I say, oh, that's impressive. But when he told me uh, what the office was, I say, that's not population health improvement. So you would agree that office is about population health management. My other office. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's good. I'm, don't worry, I'm going to give you other office some credit a little later on. Okay, but here's, here's another way that we think about that in terms of the curve. And here's where the third curve comes in. Okay, this is where we are right now. And this area under curve would be in that first de uh, depiction. Uh, first of all, the whole area under the blue curve would be the population of San Francisco County. 
this area under this red curve here, the patients that we see at UCSF. And I still say we, because I am a graduate of, uh, of, 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 um, um, of UCSF, okay. Um, now, as we shift to the second curve, the second curve to me is the population health and management. That's where we're trying to get with most health systems. When you hear about the expansion, when you hear about alliances and allegiances and partnerships, it's really about creating a broad network, comprehensive, to take care of all the integrated needs of a group of patients. That's what Kaiser is. And that is, in fact, the future. Uh, it's, we're kind of being driven there by what's happening with health care reform and in particular Affordable Care Act, but I happen to believe that overall it's good for the population. And so what's happening right now is academic health systems, UCSF spent a lot of time going from here to here. Um, and so most, in most contexts in academic health systems, when we're talking about population health without putting management improvement, this is what we're talking about in 90 plus percent of the cases. Population health improvement, watch this curve, means that now, uh, I have to tell you, they just added this feature yesterday and I like it. So, uh, you know, I found myself playing with it on the plane uh, a couple of times. I like pushing it and watching the curve shift all the way over. Uh, but, 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 but that's the idea, is that with population health improvement, we are, as we will talk about in a minute, Talking about academic health systems, we are not only working here to improve the overall health of the population and our management, but now we're working in this space with others. Working in this space with others, that's completely new territory in general for academic health systems. And many of our colleagues will say, come on, Gene, you remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs? You know, we're still down in food, water, and shelter. And you're way up here talking about change the overall population. They say, come back in five years, come back in 10 years. The argument is, is, is that as we are forging these partnerships right here, with really some augmentation, we can play a major role in helping to drive improvements in the overall, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. Why should academic health systems take on this additional uh, role, ro these additional roles and our responsibilities? Well, here are three categories of reasons. One, good business sense. Go over this in a minute. Two, I believe it's the ultimate mission. And three, uh, broader uh, social responsibility, and particularly uh, given today's context, and I'll explain why I say that. Uh, it is a good business. Uh, it makes good business sense. There is a business case for this. Uh, overall, if there's a healthier population, then there's a healthier workforce, including the people that you employ within your own organization. Second, in terms of the potential economic benefit to the organization itself, in terms of the employees. Um, we have something like, I um, was talking to uh, Sam and Josh earlier, I think we have 25, 26, 27,000 people or individuals employed in our community. Um, by focusing on these broader health needs, we're going to end up with healthy people and it's going to reduce our costs. Obviously, that leads to reduced co uh, uh, health care costs and increased profits. Attracting new employees. Now, for some, you may say this is a stretch, but the truth is there are companies when looking at where they're going to locate, look at what's available in terms of uh, the health within the community. And quite often, the first place they look is at the academic health system. Uh, both in terms of partnership, but also as a place that they want to go as, as executives, but also where they want their staff to go. Enhanced reputation, being visible, doing good. Healthier community for drawing new talent from. And then there is compliance and regulatory requirements. There are many, believe it or not, that are already on the books uh, that connects or is related to this whole idea of joining forces for population health improvement. Here's just one, one that I know at least several of you in here would be familiar with. The Affordable Care Act added a new provision that required that all academic, uh, really all hospitals complete what's called a community needs assessment. And the argument is that in completing this community needs assessment, um, why not do it with partners with the idea that you're actually going to do something about the overall health of the population? Um, and this is a case where 
pointing at Kevin's other office, where UCSF really has been in the forefront in terms of reaching out to work with a coalition to form a group that developed this so that it was developed, yes, to meet this regulatory requirement, but it also positioned UCSF to play a role along with other partners in advancing health overall. I might note that related to the business model, there is a penalty if you don't uh, uh, conduct uh, this uh, uh, in a way that meets uh, the statute. But in addition to the business case, uh, I think that it's, there's an argument that it's part of the mission. In, in most academic health centers, we will say research, education, service, or clinical care, and we embrace that. Again, some time ago, um, UCSF did uh, embrace the notion that community engagement was a part of it. I make a distinction, though, between community engagement and community health improvement because community engagement can be that we've got students and we've got staff and we've got faculty out in the community with many of your project, but that's different from saying that we've got some organized effort uh, to really drive those curves that I just talked about related to overall community health. The, besides the mission um, is this idea that if we improve health and we can lower cost, then we can also create a more sustainable health care model, not to mention we can use some of those resources for other reasons. And then there's the broader social responsibility that, um, that I just um, uh, talked about earlier, and I don't need to go into detail here. But one of the reasons why it's important to play that role right now is because of a couple of major transitions that are taking place in our world, in terms of medical or uh, the clinical world, and the world of public health. And, and that is, uh, much of what we talk about in population health in general has been the domain of the public health. I'm sure that Sandra here, uh, uh, given her roles in the past, will say, you know, a lot of what we talk about now, population health improvement, has been really the domain of the health department. And, and it has been. Uh, but increasingly, we have encroached over into that territory, and that's a good thing. Uh, immunization now, which was exclusively the domain in health departments years ago, we are now judged in terms of our quality rating on what our immunization rates are. And so we are proactively now out educating and trying to get more people in. In, 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 in old times, pu health, public health departments focused almost exclusively on communicable diseases. These days, health departments are spending probably more time on the non-communicable diseases and the chronic disease, I mean the, the uh, now chronic diseases. So as a result, at the same time these transitions are occurring, two things are happening. One is that public health resources are definitely constrained and they just are not in a position to take all of this on at this time. Two is that there seems to be a little confusion as to who's going to do what. Uh, at this critical time of transition and transformation. And so that's an argument for new leadership in this space of population health improvement. And uh, I believe that that's a role that academic health systems can and in fact should play. What is needed to advance population health improvement? Um, that first we understand what are the real determinants of, of, of health. Again, some of you have seen this. This is adapted from uh, the model that was created uh, for the county health rankings. And again, for those of you who don't know it, all counties, not all, it may be out of the over 3,000 in some counties, 100 or so, that's not ranked according to this framework, but they all rank. All the 57 counties in California are ranked. I will show you a, a little later, where in fact, where San Francisco is ranked in there. But the idea is, is, is that these are the factors that influence, and so these are the determinants, these categories in here, and these are the outcomes by which you kind of measure overall health. What's missing, if anything, from your perspective? John. Hmm. Okay, John, I think I could get the payment system as a factor down on the policies and programs, but but I hear you, but I could put that down there. I'll give you a hint. Uh, we're at UCSF, and we just recruited somebody from down the peninsula that we're all excited about to help lead a new initiative. 
Well, I'll give you even a better hint. Uh, the person who just said that is head of the area that's missing off of here. Genetics, yeah. I was thinking that much. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 let me try it again now. How many of you think genetics is the determinant of health? Okay. Well, well when, when asked about this, the reason why genetics doesn't appear is because the assumption is in this context, it's not an intervention point. Okay, and I think that that's fair. But if you want to be complete, and I'm going to show you a different model in a minute uh, that we're using as we move forward, in which we at least recognize that there is a factor, because it can be a factor as it relates to uh, certainly to medical uh, 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 to medical care, but even to some degree to population health as we now began to uh, have uh, genomic data on whole populations, okay? But any other thoughts about here? Anybody surprised by this percent? I, I, I would think they're critical. I, I think the authors of this were thinking that they kind of went across these social and economic and others, but absolutely critical. Good to see you, Carol. Andy? Uh, I just because it's so topical that our genes that we're all more, more sensitive to today, the issues of violence in our communities and the way people are made to feel safe or not safe in our communities has a big impact on their health. And I just want to I, I think that should be on here. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That safety. That should be up. That should be on environment. Yeah. So I'm going to put you on the spot here. Please do. Where's where precision medicine in the Well, I mean, precision medicine. Well, precision medicine in this context is right here. That's clinical care at the end of the day. But what is it based on? What do you say? What is it based? The practice of precision medicine. Well, first of all, this is not my diagram. We're going to get to my diagram in a minute. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, but no, in this context, precision medicine right now is about medicine and about trying to get to target as efficiently, and that's clinical care in this model. Yes, please. So what about patient preferences? A patient preference, again, I would put under health care in this context, right? Okay, so, but this is one model, okay, and this model is it's descriptive. And again, I'm going to show you toward the end uh, exactly where Sa how San Francisco stacks up uh, here. Yes, please. Are there any models like this where they have multi-manual cultural factors separated? But a lot of times people tell us that humans are dependent on or influenced on cultural factors. How do people like measure and separate those two models? Well, yeah, that's a very good point. Everybody here, they, 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 they are they're definitely closely linked. People tend to measure, a weak measure, tend to measure them separately, but it's often just adjusted for in, in the analysis that are done where there's uh, data regarding socioeconomic status, or race, or ethnicity, um, or gender. But they are different sets, and they are inextricably intertwined. Yeah, okay. So that's one model to begin to get you to think about, okay, how will we begin to improve population health? We gotta get at these, and what's important here is, is, is that I don't see anybody arguing for a higher percentage point here in this context, okay? Um, this is another model. Uh, some of you may have seen it. This is a model de de developed by uh, Tom Frieden, current head of CDC. He calls it the um, uh, health impact hierarchy. Uh, it's the same except for now he's taken them as kind of intervention points and what is required. Just to make the point again, this is where we are right now for the most part with academic health systems in terms of focusing on long-lasting protective, long-lasting protective interventions would be things like immunization again. Another one that might fall in this category would be colorectal screening, you know, every 10 years. That started with being long-lasting, assuming that those are negative. And as you move up, you got clinical interventions, that's the treatment, and counseling and education is what we do related to individual patients. Uh, but increasingly, this is what the population health improvement is going to require, that as academic health systems, we function down here. What's important, and he observes this, is, is that as you go up this, uh, it, it requires increasing individual effort. So uh, these interventions that might take place down here are less dependent on individual, eff individual 
effort. And that's important. Um, I was talking with, I guess it was Marissa or someone in a, in a group earlier today. And what's also important is that for greatest impact, it increases on what's going on down here. Uh, this is going to relate to, to, to where you're going to get the biggest bang for our bucks in terms of impact uh, when we get to that in a few minutes. Very important. I, I, I think he did a great job here in, in laying this out. Well, when we stepped back from this and started playing with it, um, we um, came up with a slightly different model. It's the same pieces, except for we wanted to focus on, on two things in particular. One that's a little different is we felt and still do, this was not my original, I did not bring this to the table. Uh, in fact, um, uh, uh, this is something I've heard Nancy talking about, but this was Molly who was saying, it's not just about health. Health is this idea of physical and even mental well-being, but wellness is this notion of, of I'm, I'm, not, I'm not just feeling healthy, but I'm feeling whole, I'm feeling engaged, uh, I'm feeling like life is good, uh, I'm feeling like it's fulfilled, uh, I'm not feeling isolated. And you can actually measure this. This has been measured across populations. And now, I know some will argue, that is truly aspirational. It is, but if we know that there is a higher order kind of, of existence beyond just health, then that's what we should be driving toward. And we can measure that, okay? So we felt like that was important to begin, at least to introduce to the conversation. The other thing is right here, this series of measured interventions. He, he, and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this now day to day. Since I've been in Durham, we can map out all the projects we have literally over North Carolina. We did some similar here when, uh, um, uh, Kevin, when, when I was here, and we did some similar in, in Los Angeles. But what is really needed, and it's hard to get to, is what are those, or what is that series of intervention, those 10 things, or those five things, or those 15 things that will literally improve the health of the population. And it rarely exists in most communities where there's agreed upon. That's where the work is, and I'm gonna talk a little something about that. We believe that when you have this series of measured interventions, that's how it's gonna drive it. These interventions are either gonna be contextual, and we combine contextual to be environment and the social, uh, uh, socioeconomic back behavioral and the biomedical. This is healthcare, but this would also factor in the genetics, the things that are just inherently there biologically. And the three that, there are so many dimensions to the intervention, but the three that uh, I'm gonna just uh, uh, briefly mention today relate to partnerships, policy, and uh, technology. To get to this series of measure interventions, and it's a tough undertaking, but it is going to require that uh, new partnerships be, uh, uh, be forged. And these are gonna be multi-sector, multi-stakeholder partnerships. Um, now, again, as we are moving toward population health management, uh, we're already reaching out and forging new partnerships. But we're doing it with the intent of having a complete network in terms of integrated, comprehensive health care to take care of all the needs of, of our patients. But many of those same partners we're reaching out to, we could be at the same time leveraging that partnership to uh, work with others in these sectors to say we're gonna help drive population health improvement. That's really one of our principal arguments. Any groups missing here? This comes from the same group that uh, developed the first framework for the Robert Johnson Foundation. <coughs> Which one? Faith base, for sure. Okay. It's in the middle. Oh, so oh, I'm so okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Claire. I think media, social media. Media, great. Okay, I agree completely. Schools. Schools. Yeah. Okay. We have education, but different levels. Schools. Okay. Well, in, in fact, to try to get at this, we, we laid this out so it could be a little bit more granular. And what was interesting is, just, just in our own community in the last couple of, uh, really in the last couple of weeks, in a couple of settings, I just put this up and say, what's missing? And we didn't have media on it. 
when we first threw it up, but media is on it now. We didn't have face bait. And so this is kind of like, um, you know, this is kind of like one of those, uh, uh, what, what do you call it? You, huh? No, 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 I'm just saying this is going to be one we're going to build on. So I'm going to pause, and if there's something that's missing from here, uh, then we'll add to it. Um, for example, we didn't have policymakers on there until just the other day. I mean, as a big category. I thought it went across theme. And that's a, that's a very important group. Yes, please. That's a very good point. Yeah, we tend to not want to list them anywhere in public, but uh, <laughs> but, 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 but but that's 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 a very good point. Okay, I'm not sure I can write that one down, but I'll remember it. Yeah, I have. So, in industry, do you have them as employers or as producers of the things that are used in the system? Both, and and that's why if you notice, they probably. Uh, appear, for example, over here is business, but they appear down here when we start talking about privates on the policymaker. But they're up there when we start talking about, uh, uh, well, we should have some that, that's on the buyers. Well, we have, we have uh, uh, hospitals, insurers, maybe we don't, do we have a Paris category? I can't see that. Well, well, I'm thinking more about the people who make the devices or the cigarettes or the whatever. Oh, yeah, no, they're up on the health care. So the devices are going to be the uh, health care, and they're going to be all in the businesses. And Krispy Kreme? Krispy Kreme, well, I didn't, I didn't think of them, but they should be on the, uh, they're not health care. Um, no, I understand, but they're at another place in, in, in North Carolina now. Yeah, yeah, well, I have to be careful what I do in North Carolina about the Krispy Kremes here, okay. Yeah, but, no, but I'm trying to figure out, where, where would that be? I, I, yeah, because it's not technology, it's not health care, but they're very important to what we're talking about. Social services? They play different roles for different purposes. They're just private business in general over here. Okay, okay. I got Krispy Kremes and lobbyists to add. But okay, it's steep. So you might want to call out biotech, pharma, et cetera. I assume it's up there in the right-hand corner, but to make it a little bit more specific given the big impact yeah, we, we, we definitely included that they would be up there as a broad category. I'm going to come back to Sandra. I, see, uh, yeah. I think the general point, uh, Steve, is that is you're making us think about things outside the biomedical world. And once you do that, uh, you can go many different places. And uh, you know, we have these competitive buildings in the built environment. We have housing and so forth. We have covered uh, uh, labor. We have covered uh, uh, other That's precisely it. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. I think one other helpful thing. That was, that was Naomi. Yeah. Um, but how I was getting at is that businesses, depending on the type of business, you might have a different incentive in how you're implementing properly in the system. So, for instance, if you're an employer who's thinking about the health of their um, employees, you're going to have a different interest than um, Krispy Kreme, who's trying to feed things to people. Yeah. So, um, that That's a good point. Okay, yeah. We, we, we want to, in fact, make this as a project um, because we want to be able to help academic health centers and then work with others in trying to define how you go about, first, what is that universal set? And within your community, how you actually go about trying to uh, forge the right set that's going to help uh, in that unique community move things along. Okay, yeah. Sandra, you had? Yeah, okay, I, um, um, it's not spelled out, uh, and so, because, yeah, but, 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 but I, I, the whole idea, the concept of urban planning, I think, needs to be more explicit here, and, and I get the point that you were making about different businesses coming at it from different interests, depending on, is not reflected here. Okay, great.
Thanks for those suggestions. Uh, to Paulia Partnerships, um, I wanted to highlight this as an example of, 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 of how you actually go about forging these partnerships. Uh, some of you will know that in 2007, how many of you kind of followed this, said the UK, they did not have before then uh, an, a, a category called academic health systems. Okay, and in fact, they didn't have academic health systems. The medical schools were over here, and the hospitals formed in the foundations were over here, and the private practice groups were over here. That's right, you all spent some time there, so you're nodding your head, uh, uh, um, and in Rebecca. And so uh, the NHS, which is the National Health Service, you think is one integrated service, say, no, we're going to forge this. So they say, we're going to put the money, and they had a review, and they created five, was it six? And uh, in fact, Oxford was not in the first group because they say, we don't have to forge with anybody, we're Oxford. And, you know, they showed them uh, that they didn't get them. And so for the first time, they forced the medical schools and the hospitals to come together in a federation. They formed the six. Um, but it still was, the goal was, in this case, was to improve patient care and healthcare delivery and serve individual patients. And so, all of these, these health systems and these academic institutions, they got together and they formed these academic health systems. And these are the kind of healthcare related partnerships that were formed. That's exactly what we're doing right now with population health management in general in the US. So for the next round, which was just uh, a little less than two years ago, I happen to be, have been there just that this has happened, they say, okay, you guys, you know, you got together, but you focus on individual care and you didn't think about the population at large. So the same uh, 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 National Health Service created what they uh, 15 um, academic health sciences networks and they took some of the money that they were giving them to provide care and put it in a pot to incentivize these academic health systems to work together to improve the overall health of the population. Once they were incentivized to improve the overall health of the population for this network. They went out and got different partners. In this case, the partnerships now with industry, with universities, with local governments, and I happen to know a couple, I know the people at Imperial College and I know the people at uh, um, uh, London City College. In fact, uh, the guy who's head there, Jeff introduced me to him. And I can tell you, they are taking on these partnerships with real gusto because there's actually some at stake. The data still remains to see how well they're gonna to work together to drive the population. But this is already happening and we have an experiment that's occurring right now, right across the water. And we can't let, uh, um, uh, we can't let England stay too far out in front of us uh, too long. So that's another reason for us to get going with these partnerships. Leverage policy. Um, conduct policy scan. Um, you follow what I'm saying by that? Uh, most cities, counties don't do this, and we just proposed it in Durham. Uh, and I proposed this to the board of, of, of county supervisors and to the mayor, and they say, okay, let's go do it. Now, I don't know what's gonna happen when we actually start trying to do it, but what this means is we're getting a team together to actually go through and look at policies across and all those areas related to see what's the effect on health. Um, and we'd like to eventually, again, have this be an exercise where uh, other cities or counties can actually go and do this, and so you see what the impact is on health. Uh, apply health lens on proposed things. That's probably already happening here, but that's like when we used to do the environmental uh, assessments. It's the same. Stimulate policy changes. It's just students and faculty and staff and others making that happen. Serve as science advisors to policy makers. And this last one, conduct strategic science uh, to inform a policy. Now, uh, again, I was talking to the junior faculty members earlier about this, but we already do this at UCSF. It's the first place I've seen it done. And there was an article in Lancet earlier this year uh, by, uh, by Sally Bromwell when he laid out this model. It was real simple. It just means rather than just doing policy research de novo, start with a question that's based on something that the policymakers need to have answered. It can be a policymaker at any level of government. It can be a policymaker in a professional society. It can be a policymaker here uh, at, at, uh, um, at UCSF. And again, we've been doing this at, here, here at UCSF. I mean, Claire was doing it. Carol Cornbrock was doing it in terms of spending time in, 
in Sacramento. I was talking to Marissa, she's doing it now with, um, but uh, many others don't think to do that. And the question becomes, you know, how do you make this bridge so that individuals here can actually have the time and the resources? Um, that remains to be uh, addressed. But there's more to this policy. Here's some examples of policies that actually work. And you remember that arrow that I say, you know, in terms of impact? This is impact. Uh, we can educate individuals about smoking and smoking and smoking, and we can get some to stop and we can try treatments. But think about, and UCSF lived this probably more than I could, because this was ground zero at some point, but think about how this changed uh, 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 the world of smoking. Uh, the same relates to um, sugar sweetened beverages uh, taxes. And I don't know where you stand. I'm not going to ask you to weigh in on this question. It is controversial, but there's some evidence. Where did you eat today? Where did you eat today? Where did you have lunch? I had lunch, I had lunch here. Yeah. Okay, so if you're in the cafeteria or around here, you can't get a, a sugar sweetened beverage here anymore. Oh, that's impressive. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, right here, say tobacco and sugar free sweetened um, um, environment. That's great. It's not even taxes. You just can't buy them. You just can't buy them. I, I think that that's the best way to have this happen. Yeah, I, I have to tell you, we have a long way to go um, uh, in Durham on, on this one. I'm, 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 I'm still trying to get the fried chicken off the menu, and I've been, I, I've been show, uh, somebody showed me the graveyard from, from those who've tried that in the past, and so, um, um, you know, I was, I, was, I was in a meeting the other day, and, and somebody said, because I take, I was telling Claire and them earlier, I, I take credit for everything that's happened at Duke this year that didn't happen last year. So, <laughs> you know, I remind them, I was not here last year, and we did not win a championship. This year we did, <laughs> national, yeah. I was not here last year, and uh, we did not win a Nobel Prize. This year I'm here, and we did. And so I was in a meeting, and I told somebody, they say, you're on a roll. I say, you know, so can we talk about the chicken? They say, you, you know, you're not doing that well yet, kid. <laughs> So at any rate, um, menu laboring, safe routes to school. But here's an example of why that works, and some of you follow this. There's a concept of, of most of what we do at the individual level is on the individual. If you relate to uh, obesity, and there's data that shows it's just not dramatic changes in, in, in terms of consumption at the individual level, uh, in terms of sugar-sweetened beverages and other things. Uh, and this came from uh, Kelly Bromwell. The whole concept, and he's written a paper about this, optimal defaults. Many of you, I know Nancy, you all, you all know this concept. But essentially, this is what happened in the case of many different policies, I'm going to show you an example in a minute, where you shift the, you shift the emphasis to policy. And the policy can change the environment. It can change the interaction in terms of the behavior. It, it, you still have choice. But the options are different that are really poor. You, it, the policy default here was you just took it away. You still have a choice. You know, you can get water, you can go somewhere and get it, but you have changed the environment. And you have, one example that will really hit home at this is here's, 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 here's a policy default, the opt-in versus opt on organ donation. Are you following it? It's pretty dramatic. These are the countries where it's assumed so the, the default is set that if you don't say something, you know, you got to donate your organ. Here you have to say something. It's pretty dramatic. Policy, and I was really excited when I was meeting with junior faculty members connected with the institute today to hear about their, uh, uh, their different projects. Uh, I think it's under leverage in general in our world in terms of um, uh, use of policy. Uh, Capitalize on technology, not much to say here. This group is going to be much more <laughs> advanced in their thinking. Um, 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 this just summarizes some thinking. Uh, you know, Molly's kind of helped us to organize what, 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 what we're going to be saying here. If there's a point to be made here, it would probably be down here. And that is, is, is that if we think about the use of technologies, most of it we've thought about it at the individual level but increasingly technologies are going to be available for us to use to manage whole uh, populations, and to, including things like helping them to monitor uh, nutrition and calorie. I mean, th that's, that's already uh, uh, available. Even beyond healthcare, where, what are the safe routes? Uh, 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 um, wh what are the best places to exercise? So there are going to be ways. You know, when I think about it, probably five years ago, I was telling our students 
that soon this was going to be as important as the stethoscope. It, it is today, and it's less the phone than the apps that are increasingly becoming available or for use. Here's an example of something just last week. Some of you may have seen this. We just announced a new app to a collaboration. Uh, Apple and, uh, and Duke created an app to screen for autism. Now, it's in an experimental mode at this point, and so it's a research project. But in this case, a kid, take out your iPhone, and the parent can have the kid look at a video. And this has been engineered to record the kid's responses to it. And this is downloaded instantaneously. So we were doing a study uh, on this, and uh, these numbers over here, it's more than that now. This is how many people were enrolled in the first three days. And this was m much more than I had been enrolled in eight months. This is technology, and it's going to be available. Now, this is an experimental stage. Uh, so we have to, you know, improve the specificity on it, but um, this, this, this is revolutionizing how we provide health care, but I think it's also going to be leveraged in the future for population health improvement. And I put the self-driving car because it kind of represents to me 2030, even though it's right around the corner, but it's the unknown. It allows you to imagine this can deliver groceries and uh, I mean, talking about fresh vegetables. Um, it's associated, from, at least from the data that I've seen, with fewer accidents, uh, better for the environment. Uh, so from a population health improvement, uh, technology is going to be a, a major role. So what should academic health systems specifically do? And I want to leave time for additional questions. Uh, one, add population health improvement to the mission. We've already talked about that. Um, Two, practice at home. You've already began to get to that a little bit. But become an integrator. Harness core strengths. Invest uh, resources. So uh, add population health improvement to the mission. That's already happened here at UCSF, and it's happening. Uh, practice at home. I was asking earlier about the numbers. I, these are the ones we got from the website um, in terms of the annual report. Uh, so a little over 28,000 individuals. And then we just estimated this based on our calculation for, for covered lives at Duke, and we came up with about 56. I'm told from Josh, it's, it's not quite that many. Um, so we got 56, let's say 50-some thousand individuals who are at Duke, in and out kind of over the year. Now, add to that, uh, I'm told there are about 170 to 200,000 people who traffic Duke in a given year. This is unique lives. So if we think of this as the home, then having no sugar-based drinks is practicing at home. Having a smoke-free environment is practicing at home. Looking at bike lanes, um, I don't know, we don't have enough land for that, <laughs> to be looking at bike lanes uh, on campus. Uh, or do we? Or do we have trails going up into the hills that we have, we have bike lanes? Uh, but Looking at that from a campus perspective is what um, uh, is implied by this idea of in your academic health system, there's an opportunity, both with the population that resides there in terms of students and residents, I mean students and other trainees and staff, but also the people who are coming through in terms of an opportunity to promote uh, healthy uh, behavior. Um, this thing about practice home, this is an initiative um, we started at UCLA. Um, a, a couple of years back, but it's everything that we've just talked about um, in terms of um, uh, a healthy uh, campus. The, the other thing is become an integrator. This is really what's been missing. And in terms of developing the series of measured intervention, this is probably, I believe, going to be one of the most critical steps and most critical tasks. And that is to have someone or group and um, since I've been um, um, at Duke and we've been having meetings, we feel like we've got the right people in the room now in terms of uh, uh, the mayor. In this case, when you're in a small, smaller town, the mayor will actually come to the meeting, you know, in terms of the Board of Supervisors, the head of the Chamber of Commerce, the businesses, the superintendent of the schools. We got, uh, we're, we're, we're literally all in the room. Um, uh, I, I would say they don't think it's an issue. I believe it's an issue. Is who really is going to kind of take the lead here? 
Um, I actually believe in this case that Duke should be the integrator, but not necessarily take the lead, uh, because this is not, shouldn't be our purview. Uh, you know, because in this case, I called an organizing meeting, they said, okay, Gene, you brought us in, let's get going. Um, and so we're trying to transition this, but it's gotta start with somebody getting people in the room and beginning to not talk about individual projects, but begin to say, with all the things we're going on, the mayor's got a poverty initiative, there, there are just all kinds of initiatives around the city and the county, but what's in the gap that we're gonna need to fill in to complement what's going on now so that we actually move the improvement of the health in a measurable way? Yes, Neil. Um, before you enter into the leader, are you saying it's the Department of Public Health? Yes, I think it should be at the level of county or city government in this case, and so yes. I think it should be, uh, and in, in, in that region, like in Southern California, the county government is the more influential. And so I, I think that, yes, I think they should be the leaders. The, I mean, the actual leaders. Uh, for example, the last meeting we had, the first two were, were at Duke, and I just say we should meet here next time. And I, I learned some of this from experiences uh, uh, here, where we'd have meetings here before community groups would say, no, we need to, we need to meet in more neutral territory. But I think it should be, uh, very good question. I think it should be uh, county or city government. Anybody disagree with that view? Yes, Dr. Andreessen. Yeah, 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 no, very good question. I don't know about the global warming, but um, uh, a faculty member who was here, who um, uh, uh, many of you know, Gavin Yemi, uh, and I had a conversation with him about this, and he said to me, when you go all the way back even to the mission and sort of the benefits of it, he felt like anything that we do here in terms of improving health was going to benefit what was happening globally and vice versa, and so that we should not just think of population health improvement as just in the county. We should think of it as sort of starting local, but being global, and, and that it, it feeds both ways. I, I can't link it directly to global health warming, but I'm glad you made that point, because that is important. Dr. Durney. Gene, what do you think about the role of, of the emerging role of huge foundations, for example, the Gates Foundation? Yeah. They seem to have become the convener uh, at least in subject areas they're interested in. Yeah. They're not interested in everything yeah. that affects population health. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that they have a critical role. It, again, in our case, we have a big foundation like that, um, and that foundation is, is, is very, very supportive of this initiative. Uh, that we've been talking about and, and or at the table, and that is the Duke Endowment um, uh, in, in North Carolina. But even with that, I just don't think that at the level of a county or a city that the foundation should be in the lead role. I think it should be an enabling role and should be a major support in the same way I think academic health system. But I do think that if nobody's doing it, the academic health system should be the integrator and get it going and get people to the table. And that's really what the argument here is, is that recognizing that it, it, it requires uh, building that trust, but it requires um, uh, uh, persistence. And it requires the focus on not just a lot of projects, but coming up with the set of interventions that actually you believe, when you add them up, it measures to some impact. Yes, please. Yeah, how do, how do other types of boundaries, because yeah. these people's lives are physically based and the academic health system is physically based. I can see that the yeah. organizing that way and, right. and all of the structures and organizations are already organized that right. way, yet people's lives tend to you know, include all sorts of intersections that are not just related to the one physical area. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, no, that's a very good point. Everybody's, my, 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 my Stanford colleague here, this is another evidence-based practice. <laughs> practice. No, I, I, I'm not, 
I hope I'm not saying all this is physical pain. I'm using the geographic boundaries just as a way conceptually to say we got to be thinking about the population. But that population is not bound. That population is moving around all the time. And I'm certainly thinking about that in terms of the actual people. And so the technology is going to help with them even when they're out of the county. So I'm thinking of it more as an organizing uh, principle than as a fixed boundary because it, it is quite dynamic. I saw a few hands. Were well, you going to come in on that? Well, Dr. Jean, I was just going to say that the question of who should lead this, I think, very much depends on the geopolitical dynamic. Yeah. In a progressive city, yeah. a government leader might well be the most important to be. Yeah. There are many places in the country that are very segregated, very isolated, and yeah. very politically, I would argue, yeah. unable to lead this kind of an effort. Yeah. Yeah. Which I don't think there is a single answer to who is the best leader in a community to be. Very, I think you have to take into account the political system. Very good point. In fact, um, I understand that in Rochester, New York, IBM, for example, some of you may know the example of that, actually led that effort. Uh, I'm blanking on his name now, but it's a very good point. Uh, I remember that too, that the answer to that is it's, it depends on the, as you say, yeah, yeah, that the situation. That's exactly, that's right. Right. Right, right, right. Well, well first of all, I, I think that that's why, to me, it's critical to, to know what it is that you're trying to move forward in terms of this series of marriage and invention because even the new person that's coming in will come in with that having clearly stated, been stated as, as with the metrics so that you can measure it. Um, it's like in any project, it's like building you know, a, a, a cathedral that's going to go on for many years. You know, you know, you're going to you're going to you're going to build this floor or this section, and you've got plans. And so that's why I think having that plan with metrics and measuring progress is critically important. The the multi-sector, multi-stakeholder is also important because it's not all one pot of money, and each sector is going to play a different role. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But it's important to understand what what is the role of the sector and how you actually help them sustain their role over a period of time and beyond multiple, multiple uh, leaders. The idea is that you could argue, I haven't modeled this out, but you could argue that if this is done right, you're actually going to save money overall and that you're going to have money that you can invest back in other programs. So you could really argue, I mean, at least theoretically, that there is no net cost here. Uh, in terms of, the, it may be some upfront net cost, but that the idea would be, and that's what happened with tobacco taxes or with sugar free taxes, is some money, but it was plowed back into the programs that were for nutrition and for obesity prevention. Yeah, Harold. Yeah. So, so part of what I'm trying to think about here is particularly special role for the um, academic center or the university. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, about this very effective tax on uh, sugar sweetened beverages in Mexico yeah. potentially being rolled back. Yeah, sorry. Because of the various political power. Right. Um, and I think that is even easier to happen at, at a local level. Um, but one of the things that the university has that makes it unique is tenure. Right. So you get Stan Glantz, and you've got Stan Glantz. Um, and There's only one stained glass, Harold. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the, the academic center can actually bring people in who will continue to do things, pushing forward this notion of a vision, being relatively impervious to the political pressures that you can have moving back and forth because while socially you may save money, yeah. some industry is probably going to lose money. Yes, that's right. That's right, and, and not going to want to participate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or the manufacturers of ever sweet beverages. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and. So, so, so th th that's what I see as the 
special role for why an academic center? Oh, we, we've got the freedom and, and the margin and to do that. And freedom and the longevity. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, you, you're helping me make my wrap-up comments in a few minutes. No, yeah, but no, no. Was there other? Nancy? The kinds of uh, metrics you need are not now routinely collected. So and if you're doing yep. large-scale interventions on socioeconomic status, that's, that can't be just a need-focused outcome. So how are you thinking about what metrics can be obtained to allow an evaluation of, of these? Well, um, that may be a good segue to harness the core strengths is, I don't know how, but again, that would be a role in terms of research, is establishing the baseline of health, we already have to conduct a needs assessment, evaluating the interventions, that's where we've got to come up with those metrics. Um, what Gavin uh, has told me is that, um, it was actually tell me about one study where they've, they've done this, at least in another country, it was a community health improvement, they had a randomized trial and actually showed that it did, in fact, not just save money, but actually improve. This is when his case was a run around trial where they were trying to change the physical environment in terms of some roads and some water. Pretty dramatic, but the outcomes. And he was saying you actually can begin to uh, develop the metrics. And this is an example where it's been done in another country and we would do it here. I can't tell you where they are, but this is a role that we play in academic health institution and where we're uniquely positioned to do that. But you're right, we're gonna need that. Okay. George. So, you know, the end user You know, in the old days, if George raised his hands, you ignored it because you didn't want to ask, he would asked you a tough question. Yeah. So, um, I've told you've meddled, George. So. The end user here is the population and really nothing will change with a population until you can energize them give them the will, the will to accept any of these changes that we're proposing kind of from this top down effect. So yeah. where is the where 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 is that energy going to come from to actually energize the population to be prioritizing their health care in the way that we yeah. think is second nature, why wouldn't anybody want yeah. to do that? Yeah. How where is that will going to come from and who's going to push that? Because that has to be the, yeah. uh, an element that's thought of very strategically to the type of change. Yeah. Well, I have to tell you, George, but, but before, <laughs> but, no, 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 before, before, I started work, before I started working on this project with Kelly Brown now, I believed that. Uh, and and I, I can't answer your question. I think we still need to be focused on the individual. But I, I, I now think that most of this is going to come from the broader policy level and from the bigger interventions. I happen to believe that that arrow in terms of the impact on the population health improvement is going to be regrettably through that second set of defaults that I talked about. And so it's got to be complementary. They come together. But I think that we're not going to get where we want to be in this regard if we just focus on individuals. Okay. Uh, and we need a complementary energy. I can't tell you where it's going to come from. I've kind of been thinking on this one. Okay. Joe and then Dan. Yeah. 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 So that's really yeah. Kind of my, my uh, is this being filmed? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm always careful when I say this because I still find it amazing. Um, <laughs> we we uh, uh, <laughs> let's just put it like this: in the case of Durham, uh, there there are not many competing hospitals. Um, um, yeah, uh, we provide 90% of the care through our health system. And so I'm speaking for that when I go in as president and CEO of the health system. But in Raleigh, it's a different story where we also have a, a campus and a hospital. And there, though, it's three, us and two others, and we've met with them, and they're on board. Yeah, you know, for now, until you really get down to it, but they are on board right now. Uh, and it's a good starting point because we, we already are thinking about 
Both those we were talking to, this goes back to the point about with a little augmentation. Both those partners we were already talking to, they're not partners yet, but we were already talking to them about some kind of alliance in order to get to population management. And so now, you know, a new guy shows up and I'm, I'm saying, okay, well, let's keep talking about that, but let's think about what we can do with Chamber of Commerce here and with, with education and with uh, uh, city and county government. Yeah, but no, that's a good starting point and good point. We should start with those who, you know, what we already speak the same language. Yeah, okay. I want to wrap up so we can open up for some questions. Um, and it, last, invest resources. Again, I'm proud to say UCSF is way out in front. Uh, $5 billion enterprise, 6.2, you know, lots of jobs. And you can see, you know, over 100, over 175, $106,000 last year in uncompensated care. So UCSF is already doing well as it relates to really uh, practicing at home and also investing in resources. So as a wrap up, I, I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll leave you with uh, a challenge, some may say an opportunity, and I'll leave you with a question. Here's the challenge or the opportunity, okay? This is UCSF's ranking, not UCSF, but this is your county, this is your San Francisco. We own it from a UCSF perspective. Uh, 57 counties. And what they do is they rank all the all all the the cities in the in the uh, in, in you know all the counties in the state by quartiles, and so if you got 57, uh, we're in the top quartile when it comes to physical environment, but in terms of the view uh, the view and and the Bay Bridge, uh, we don't we don't have much to do with that, so we can't take too much credit for that. But um, but that's first quartile, uh, cl clinical care. Only thing that surprised me when I looked this up, I've been telling my mother since I was a medical student here that we were number one, you know, and I was telling her we were number one in the country until I got to Duke. Uh, now I have to adjust that. <laughs> uh, we're doing well there. Um, uh, health behaviors we're doing, but look at this. Quality of life, uh, a length of life. These are the kind of the two overall outcomes measures. In this case, this is, this is not the first quartile, this is not even the second quartile of, of, uh, of third. Now, you can ask what that is about. I've gone to look at the, uh, I've gone to look at the data. Uh, but nevertheless, and you can even criticize some of this. There are other ways to measure it. San Francisco is doing well. But by this metric alone, we're accustomed to being at the top. And we are in some categories. But these are the two at the end of the day that in general these rankings look at to say what is the overall health status of a county, and we've got we've got room to improve there. And I would, you know, I would, Kevin, when you shift from the health system to your other office or in combination, you've seen these before. Um, um, these should move up, and that's certainly what we are saying. In you know, in the new role that I'm in, and then I would leave you with this question. Many of you have seen it. It's been used in different contexts. Um, the Dukes, the UCSF, the UCLA's, the, uh, the Stanford's, uh, these are the academic health centers that come back to what you're saying with margin, with uh, the kind of legacy of, of excellence and impact that we're celebrating here today in, 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 in Dr. Eisenberg's name, and the margins that we have, we're the ones that can do this. And it's coming at a time when we just have to couple it with efforts already underway uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to drive toward population health improvement uh, to ensure that we, we maximize this moment and actually uh, uh, improve the overall health of the population. So uh, thank you and uh, questions. <laughs> I, I, I want to present to you a, a small token of appreciation, but also the legacy of this uh, for, for today, for the John Eisenberg and John Eisenberg's memory and legacy. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very Thank much. You. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, let's get a picture. Hold okay, on. we'll get some. Okay. Okay. And now, Steve, you can have the first question. So building off of your last slide, um, could you tell us a little bit about the implications of all of this for how we change how we train uh, health professionals and how
how do we create, uh, I mean, part of the uh, super cost I think that there is in is how we create these kind of cross-sector, cross-boundary leaders yep. to get some of this stuff done with the yep. yeah. 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 Um, well, I like what the Robert Johnson Foundation is doing. Many of you will follow that, the whole initiative around building a culture of health. Um, I remember when they announced, this. I'd gone off the board, when they announced that they were going to discontinue the Robert Johnson Clinical Scholars Program, I heard from scholars all around the country saying, you know, Gene, they can't do that. And I just said, you know, some really smart people. So you've got to trust that they've got, and I like where they've landed. So one of the major initiatives there is essentially to drive this vision around interdisciplinary training. And um, I don't know who we ended up with the grant yet, because uh, the competition is still underway. But one of them is around interdisciplinary training, where whoever is going to end up with it as the hub of the training center is going to be training for this kind of workforce around population health improvement. And the idea is, is, is that. Um, <coughs> It's not going to be like one center where we used to have at the institute where all the fellows come there. That will be the headquarters. But around the country, different fellows will be selected and they have to be paired with people in their local communities around these kind of projects. But they'll be a part of a cohort that's getting didactic training. And so at that level, we're going to need a whole new concept. I don't think right now this is going to take place at the level of medical schools or nursing schools or pharmacy or dental schools or even schools of public health in terms of this combination. But um, I think in five years, it would be more commonplace. And I think right now, some of this is beginning to take root in some of the really progressive training programs. I'm talking about at the level of, uh, of fellowships that are already in place. Um, um, I think we need new kinds of fellowships that combine with public policy, with engineering, and with all the health sciences schools. So, so what is this, you know, if you can elaborate on that a little bit, what sure. kinds of changes are occurring or do you want to stimulate at Duke? And it's yeah. occurring here at UCSF. So yeah. this is one example from Mayo County that was going to medical school, and if you go to the Scottsdale campus now, they require all the medical students to also get a master's degree in systems engineering. Mm -hmm. okay. You have to get both. All of them. Yeah. That's impressive. All Mm -hmm. So what kinds of things of that sort are you encouraging or might somebody encourage? Yeah, no, oh, I think it's an excellent point. Um, I was telling Claire and them earlier, which uh, that, that she had heard about. We just, we just last week announced a new uh, Center for Health Policy that uh, Mark McClellan is going to be coming in. And we, we patterned it in many ways after the UCSF uh, Institute. But as part of that, there's going to be a new training program. And that training program is going to be actually based in, 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 in public policy and business and medicine, but they will be from the other, other, other campuses uh, as well. And it's going to start at the master's level. But the way that at least Mark and others envision it, it may be three or four different kinds of masters, depending on your interest in, in policy. And it's not just policy at the national level, it would be policy at the state level. And so um, the idea that Mark has envisioned is that we would in fact create some kind of federation of training with other institutions in other states that began to create this cohort uh, 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 together. So I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I do think that it's going to have to call on, within our own academic environment, those disciplines that are connected to those other sectors that we are not already connected to. For example, when I first got to Duke, I was making rounds to meet with the other deans. and so. Uh, you know, I went with, uh, uh, well, I already see the, the nursing and uh, global health and medicine because I work with them. But I went to see the dean of engineering because we have collaborations. And I went to see uh, the dean of public policy because I was collaborating with him. And I said, to round this off, I should go see the dean of uh, the School of Divinity. Turned out they have major programs in health. And, and I mean, pretty significant programs in health. So we pulled them in. It was the same with the School of uh, Environment. Just to round it off, I, when I say major programs, some of them actually have master's degrees in divinity. They have a PhD track that's around health, and I learned a great deal. So in the same for the Bay Area, 
this is an area where I know we used to have the program through the Robert Johnson Scholars in Society. We really are going to need those programs to continue. But I believe we're going to have to connect them a little bit more with actual kind of the policy makers and or the people at the county and or the state level who's going to help drive this kind of change. I can't. Can Thank you. That's the dean. He, the, the, you know, the dean gets to do it. Repeat my question. Okay. I hate to ask this question, but I want to hear your answer. And we're touching on it. So you didn't define what an academic culture is. That's that's great. Yeah. What it is that you've run now. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's a very good question. I mean, it's a fair question. No, you, you shouldn't say you, you hate to ask. I've been asked it before. So, I, you know, I still use the technical term because I've looked it up now um, through the AAMC and through the Association of Academic Health Centers. I asked them for a definition once. And they said, well, we don't really have anything. I said, well, I mean, you know, come on, it's the name of the association. Send me your charter. <laughs> um, um, but, I mean, technically, the technical definition. It's a clinical entity that has a medical school and or other health sciences schools, kind of a medical school, and or, because they had to, uh, they had to modify. And I'll give you a classic example. They had to modify because institutions like Cedars were saying, you gotta be kidding, of course we're an academic health system. And we consider them. And say modified, say and or affiliated with uh, a medical school or nursing school or school of public health or an academic health science. But it's got to have the combination of the clinical system and the academic system as its integrated core missions. Um, and so that's how I define academic health systems. Sure. And, and yes, they are, they are evolving, but I don't think that the core missions are changing. I'm asking, I'm suggesting that we add one, but I don't think the core missions of research and education and clinical care or service is being challenged. I, well, I think the balance of it is being challenged, and I think, it, yeah, it, no, that part is definitely being challenged, but I think the core mission is there. Yeah, I, guess, I guess it's the balance that I'm worried about. And when I, and when I talk about this, we talk about this, we talk about comparison. We just, we just branded ourselves UCSF Health. Right. Well, I can tell you, I weighed, I weighed in on this one earlier, Talmadge, and I can tell you, I thought it would be simpler here. Because here, I thought, because UCSF is an academic health system and campus, I thought that UCLA, I mean, not UCLA, but UCSF health. Believe me, I got, in, I got in trouble so many times at UCLA for saying UCSF, so come on, you all have to let me get away with one or two of these. Yeah, 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 yeah. no, no, but I thought it would be simply here because I assumed when I heard UCSF help, I assumed it referred to just the clinical enterprise, and that made sense to me because there's UCSF that encaptures uh, UCS help, UCSF help, Medical school, dental school, pharmacy school, nursing school. That was clean to me. It's different at UCLA where we use the term and it's different at Duke because we are not separate from the rest of the campus. So at Duke, and by the way, we're just rolling this out too. Duke is still Duke Madison on most slides. So we officially roll it out in January. But Duke Health as we've defined it, we've defined it in two phases. It is the portfolio of health related activities at Duke, that's where we wanna go. But for now, Duke Health is medical school, the medical school in Singapore, the Global Health Institute, this new health policy uh, institute, uh, the nursing school, and the Duke University health system. 
that is what is Duke Health. Our long-term vision is Duke Health would mean anything that's health related, including those programs and the other schools that's, that's, that's at Duke. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, John, I think much of what's happening, I'm talking about even the population health management, again, I'm stating my bias, I think it's good. Because I think it's forcing us to be more patient-centered in our care. I think it's forcing us to focus more on coordination of care and, and reduction of waste, all, you know, all the things that we and others have written about. And I happen to believe that that's, I happen to believe that that's good. I also think that it's forcing us, as we think about managing a population for some set amount of money, to put more emphasis in places like primary care. Uh, I mean, I would suspect, uh, Kevin, you still in charge of primary care? Or, I would never say that. Well, okay, well you were directing the primary care or whatever. I mean, you know, from a health system, I, I suspect we're putting more resources there now than we ever have in the past because we want more of those patients who are in the emergency room where we used to get, or we still are, but as things change, um, those affordable, those uh, preventable hospitalizations that you know Andy used to uh, 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 publish about, we don't want them in the hospitals anymore. So we're gonna, so it's gonna, I believe, eventually, we're not there yet, but I think it's gonna force us to line that up uh, better. So I'm not worried about that. To get to your second part though, funds flow is a problem in academic health systems, but I think it starts at the top in terms of your values and how you see yourself. And that's the way I would answer that. If you see this as a core and a bit important part of your mission, when you look at that big pot of money, when you look at it in the end, you can decide that some of this is going to go to the kinds of things that I'm talking about right now. So much of you know, what I'm talking about, I'm, I'm saying to two leaders of academic health systems. Okay. Well, I'm going to be around, Claire, for those who have other things. And again, thank you for inviting me. Yeah.